so first, uh, the first online quiz has, has been due, and uh, today you can see that I will first go through the 10 questions of the quiz. And uh, generally speaking, I think uh, the entire class have a good performance on the quiz. The second thing, so I, uh, last evening I post a midterm survey on the Sakai under the test and quiz tab. And it contains multiple survey questions. And I hope that in your convenience, you can uh, participate in that survey and uh, give me some of the feedback and a suggestion for this course. And uh, for example, for some students already uh, give me the feedback and uh, uh, ask about some questions about the formats and the, especially for the programming part of this course. So, I think that is a very good point, and I also would like to explain and clarify here. So computer architecture, this course, especially for the graduate level computer architecture, so it is type of the system course instead of a design course. So, so essentially, so yes, no or very, very little programming part. So if you take a look at so our major reference book, so you can see that, so actually the entire content is kind of the more description and the introduction instead of the implementation. For the undergraduate level computer architecture, so you can have many like the, the assembly, Codes programming parts, but for here for the graduate level computer architecture, so this the the situation is kind of different. Uh, so give for example, so how many of you already learned the var log of VHDL before? How many of you? And uh, some students say, say they they used the Verilog before. So how many for you never used the Verilog before? Or VHDL? Any of you or all of you use the Verilog? Okay, so some students never use that before. Okay, so then here's the problem because so. So in the class, the students have kind of a diverse background. And for the computer architecture, so if I if I plan to like to do some programming, so since this is a hardware course, so for example, if I ask you to like to design a simple processor, and then so that's a problem. So typically you need it's better that you first need to have the prior knowledge of, of Verilog. So you can, if you take a look at the, the textbook of the undergrad level computer architecture, our minor reference book, so you have some appendix that is systematically introduced to Verilog. Okay, so, so that is a lot of the content, but uh, for this graduate level course, we cannot cover all of them. We have we just have the one semester course. 
That's a problem. Okay. And that's a reason. So I give you a simulation project. And uh, during the simulation project, you can utilize some simulator to to get involved in some of the experience. Uh, kind of the program experience, and not the design experience. So if you have already prior knowledge and experience of like the Verilog, so I encourage you that you can try to do some like the, the implementation final project or development in your final project. But to be fair with all the students in the class. So, so I think that it's better to uh, to reduce the, the programming part of the course. So because of first the nature of this course and the second the background of the students. So I would like to explain this. And uh, if you once already took my pr previous like a VSI design course or the introduction to deep learning course, you know that. So we have uh, plenty of the, the programming assignments and uh, examples in the lectures because for those two courses, they're kind of the more design course. So you can learn the very log in, the, in my VSI design course. So you need to do a lot of the, the Python programming in my deep learning course. But this course, this computer architecture course, this is kind of the more system system level course. And uh, if you have one copy of a major reference book, you can see that. So there's a lot of content actually we cannot cover in this one semester course. Typically, it's better to have the two semesters to cover all the material, but we have only have one semester. And actually, you can see that, so the official name of this course is Computer Architecture 1. So normally speaking, we should have a Computer Architecture 2, but, but currently, in our department, we only have this one Computer Architecture. Actually, considering the background, some students even never took the undergraduate level computer before. So I have to select the suitable materials from the reference book and to form this one semester course. So I hope that so you can understand this point. Any questions? Okay. So if you would like to learn more about the programming, like the very log, so I'm not sure in the future, so the VSI design course will is still re delivered then next fall or not? Because typically that will be in the fall or by me, but this semester, so there's no VSI design course. But in the future, we'll have that. So then uh, we can discuss more in like the very log programming in that course. And if you want to have the like the more software code or uh, software programming. Especially for machine learning, so then so you're welcome to take my deep learning course in the next spring. So there's a lot, plenty of the, the Python programming you can learn from that course. So for this computer attach course, so there's a lot of the I understand that there's a lot many like the abstractive description and the content, and uh, so I. Hope that if you have any questions, 
for some of the new port mechanism or the, the organization of the, the system so during the lecture so i hope that you can interrupt me and ask me to re explain again the, something like that so that will be very 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 encouraged and welcome okay so go back to the class content so first we will go through the quiz one and then we will finish the lecture five and then begin the lecture six so first let's go through the 10 questions okay so the first one which of the following is not the metric when we evaluate the computer performance? A, throughput and speed. B, cost and the reliability. C, color and the energy. Which one? Yes, it's C, right? Because throughput and speed, this is about the timing, right? That is very important. Cost and the reliability. That is also, that is not the traditional metric, but right now it's also become very important, right? Especially for the reliability, very important for the computers in the data center. Cost is very important, especially for the embedded system. Like in the, Embedded applications, so the price of the, the chip that is very, very important so because the total budget for this for embedded system should be set to kind of low, low to have the, the business competitions. And that's a reason, like, for example, why the NVIDIA's uh, embedded GPU that is kind of the not quite competitive in the many IoT uh, devices. Because for the entire IoT device, sometimes IoT board, so like the price, the total price for the entire board may be just uh, tens of dollars. But for one embedded, TP, uh, embedded GPU of NVIDIA that may already be kind of the more than $100. So that is kind of too expensive. And in that case, so we cannot have the, like the even lower end of GPU on board. We only have the like the MCU or the ARMS on MCU and so on. The cost is also important. So, but for the, for the color, so actually that is not what you want to kind of very emphasized. And second, which of the following statements is correct? A, mobile computing devices emphasized on energy efficiency. B, pursuing reliability is the top priority of the, the desktop. C, when considering the computers for server, price is the most important. Which one is correct? A, B, or C? Yeah, that is A. Mobile computing device emphasize energy efficiency. This is because of the battery budget. This is very, very important for the energy. While for the desktop, reliability is not the priority. Reliability is typically the priority of the data center and so on. Just a single example. So remember that it's last week or two weeks ago, some, something happened in, for the Facebook service, right? Is, is the news of last week or the two weeks ago? Many like the like the, the 
many surveys of the Facebook were done. All right. And uh, so you can see that that is a big problem for those that the cloud serv service provider. Reliability is very, very important. And uh, price is not the most important thing for the computers on the server. So that is like the, the like the, the individual customers is kind of sensitive to price. But for the uh, user of the, the server, data center, so typically that the big companies, they don't kind of too care about the price, but the reliability and like the, the throughput, so that is that is more important. For the embedded system, for the mobile systems, energy efficiency is very important because you cannot plug in the uh, the into the outlet electric outlet all the time. Energy efficiency that is important, and also that is the reason why. ARM based architecture that is so dominant and popular as compared to the Intel's x86. So, for the performance, like the mobile, the, like the, the ARM based architecture, architecture maybe it's not quite efficient as the Intel's, but it is specifically designed that have to can achieve the good energy efficiency. That is very important. Any questions? Okay, so problem three, what is the key idea that MDEL's law will use? A, parallelism should be fully taken advantage. B, exploring temporal and spatial locality is the battle. C, we should focus on common case in the workload. A, B, or C. Yeah, that is C. So MDL's law actually the key idea is that so we should pay more attention to the common case in the workload. And when you want to improve of the, the modify the or or more optimize your system so pay more attention to put more efforts on the part that that is kind of the can provide more common improvement in your entire workload with the same effort budget so target to the common case that is more that is very important Exploring temporal and spatial locality, that is the, the, the key motivation of the, the cache design, right? That is the key motivation of cache design. For example, why we want to have the, the multi-word cache? Because we want to explore the spatial locality, right? For example, why we have the in lecture five, so we introduce the TLB. So why we want to introduce the TLB? So in many cases, the instructions, they have the temporal locality you can utilize. And the parallelism, that is, we also, we always want to take advantage, but that is not the key idea of MDOS law. So if you take a look at, so the, Our main reference book, so actually we pursue to explore the different level of parallelism. The date the instruction level parallelism and the data level parallelism and so on. Question four, which is not the drawback of direct mapping cache? A relatively lower cache heat rate. 
does not provide enough flexibility for locating data. C, relatively lower design cost for cache controller. A, B, and C. Which one? Notice this is not the drawback. Okay. Yes, it's C. So let's take each option one by one. So direct map cache have the relative lower cache leach rate. So notice here, actually, we, what we want to compare this with the, the set associative cache. So yes, direct mapping cache typically has the relative lower cache leach rate. But that is correct. That is. That is its drawback, right? It does not provide enough flexibility for locating data, yes. Because all the mapping is already fixed. So unlike the set associated cache that can provide you certain type of the, the uh, flexibility within the set. So direct mapping cache doesn't provide such a flexibility. So this is not a drawback. See, relative lower design cost for cache controller. So as compared to the set associated with cache, direct mapping cache actually has the low design cost for the cache controller. So if you go back to see now the slides in the lecture three, the cache basic. So for the set associated with cache, actually we have to have the more comparators, right? Using each set to do that. But for direct mapping cache, you just have need to need like the tag tag information. So actually, we gain the benefits here, but then we lose some like the cache hit rate and other parts. So the answer is C. Lecture, uh, sorry, the question five, which type of locality is aimed to be explored when using multi-word block in the cache? A, spatial locality, B, temporal locality, C, content locality. A, B, or C. Yes, that is a spatial locality. So the key motivation why we want to extend from the one word block to the multi word block is because, so based on many observations in the actual instruction codes, so we find that some many, many cases, so there existed a spatial locality among the adjacent instructions. So in that case, so we prefer to, when we load some the data from the cache, from data of the one instruction to the cache, we prefer to load the adjacent data in the adjacent instructions to the same block of the cache. So the answer is A. Which of the, question six, which of the following statement is not true? A, set associative cache can be viewed as the, the trade-off between the fully associative cache and the direct mapping cache. Set associative cache can be viewed as the balanced solution between pursuing high hit rate and low cache controller cost. C, set associated cache can be viewed as the balance between L1 cache and DRAM. Which one is not true? A, B, or C? C, 
C, right? So set also can set associated with cash. Yes, it be view can be viewed as the trade-off between the fully associated cash and direct mapping cash. Right? Or you can see that the, the fully associated cash and direct mapping cash can be viewed as the two extreme case of the set associated cash. And for the B, so yes, because for the fully associated cash, actually it pursues the high hit rate. Why for the direct mapping cache, it target to it can pursue to low controller cost. And the set of social cache as the trade-off between these two extreme cases. For well, these two metrics, it's also kind of provide a balanced solution. B is correct. C set of social cache can be used the balance between L1 cache and DRAM. That is correct. incorrect. So this actually, there are two different type of concepts. L1 cache and the DRAM and two L3. Actually, that is that is, represents the the hierarchical level in your memory system. So L1, L1, the L1 cache can be used can be implemented using the set of social cache or direct mapping cache or the fully social cache and so on. So that is. Two different level of concepts for the cache type and the cache level. Question seven: Which is not correct regarding right allocate scheme? A. It is suitable when data is written but not used right away. B. It increased right operations to the entire memory system. C. It is not used for cache right hit. Which one is incorrect? What is your answer? And the student said the answer is A. So, so first tell me, so what is the difference between the right allocate and the right no allocate? What is the difference? Any volunteer? Some students gave the answer right allocates right to both cache and memory, while no right allocate is just for memory. Can you see my slides? Okay. So now let's review the right allocate and right now because I found some students uh, make some mistakes when during the quiz of this.
So here's the right allocate and the right, no, no right allocate. So first, one thing that is these two solutions, it is for the right miss. For the right miss. And with the right allocated policy, so the cache will also be updated. Notice that that is suitable when the data is written and immediately used. And that's the reason why we want to have the, that's the reason why we want to update the cache. Because since the data will be used in the very near future, so we hope that next time, even we made mistakes this time, next time, we want the cache can help. Well, for the no write allocator, so we only write the memory, directly write memory. And this is suitable for the case when the data is written but not immediately used. So we don't need to, it's predicted, so the cache, uh, the, the data will not be used in the near future. So there's no need for us that to write to the cache to put this data in the cache. Since the, the, the philosophy cache is to store those that are frequently used data. And uh, then go back to can you see my slide? Uh, can you see my screen? Please questions. Okay. Then go back to this. It is suitable for red allocate. It is suitable when data is written but not used right away. So that is incorrect, right? So right allocate, it is suitable for when data is written and will use the right away. So answer A is incorrect. B, it increased write operation to the entire memory system. Yes, because for the right allocate, so you need to write to both the cache and the main memory. So actually the right, op right operation is, is heavy. See, it is not used for cache write hit. That is correct. It is targeted for the write, cache write miss. So then the answer is A. Okay, so next, what is not, a what is not the principle when we design cache hierarchy? In L1 cache focus on the fast access time. In L2 cache focus on good hit rate. The L3 cache is a must for all the computers. A, B, or C. What's your opinion? Yeah, that is C. So for the cache hierarchy, so as introduced in the lecture, uh, in the lecture three, so. L1 cache, typically we won't have the fast access time. So the hit rate can be, it doesn't need to be very high because we have the L2 cache can serve as kind of the safety net. But for the L3 cache, it's not a must. For many computer systems, we don't have the L3 cache. Okay. That is very important. Thing. So question nine, using merging writing buffer techniques, we have paid the extra cost on A, increasing missing penalty, B, increasing missing rate, C, increasing complexity of controller mechanism, A, B, or C. Any opinion? Yes, it is C. So using the merging writing buffer, so we will not, we will not increase the, the missing penalty rate, but the actual cause that, so because you need to find, identify those that the data that can be merged together to in the buffer to the same cache block. 
So this process, this search, this matching, this identification, identify process, it, it will bring the actual cost and the actual complexity of your controller. So the answer is C. So question 10, so way prediction technique cannot be viewed as a trade-off between the heat time and the miss rate, trade-off between the cache size and the heat time, see trade-off between the cache bandwidth and the power consumption. Which one is the correct answer? Cannot be viewed as. What is your answer? Some students say it is C. Any other opinion? Yes, the answer is C. So, so what is wave prediction technique? So that is one type of the advanced cache optimization approach. So we want to predict for the set of social network cache, we want to predict the set or the way, right? Okay, so why won't do that? So we want to reduce the heat time. But for this prediction, no matter it's a wave prediction or like the, for the branch prediction, so since it's a prediction, so then you need to pay the potential penalty of the, the prediction accuracy. It's, it will be not kind of the 100% accurate. Okay, so A is correct. And for the B, for the way prediction, actually, we will introduce actual prediction bit there. Actually, you increase the cache size. So it's also trade-off between the cache size and the heat time. So B is correct. And for C, so that is incorrect. So trade-off between the cache bandwidth and the power consumption, so this is incorrect. So, any questions for all of these 10 questions? Okay, so if you have any further questions for the quiz, so you can, in my, in my today's office hour, so you can uh, further ask me. You can, as I mentioned before, so for this type of the online quiz, so typically my main emphasis is to test you, your understanding for the basic concept. So there's no calculations and so on. But all I want to see that so you can, you have a good understanding for the basic knowledge and concept. Sometimes for those to the kind of the, the for the especially for the difference between the kind some of the very similar uh, ruling points and the, the the knowledge points to compare them and to cl clarify that difference. I think that can help you to improve your understanding of the, the computer. And uh, the quiz two will follow the similar format, like the 10 multiple choice questions. And I will announce the when we will have the quiz two, online quiz two. And probably it will be in the like the, the in the like the, the late November and so on. Okay, so 
this is for the quiz one and uh, now now let's go back to the let's go back to the lecture five so this is here where here where we were uh, last friday okay first let's finish the lecture five so we already learned the discussed the four questions about a virtual memory so how should we organize that how to find the page and uh, what happened when we have a page fault? How to replace the page? And how about the right? So then, so put it together. So this is not a kind of put everything together. But this is something that, especially for the TLB part, for the have a look aside buffer. So when we consider with the virtual memory together, so you can see that. So when we, we have a virtual address, and first we will go to the TLB. We'll go to TLB. Notice that TLB serves as a cache, and uh, we use the TLB and to to know whether we have a TLB heat or not. And if so, so then we will have to do. physical address available because TLB actually it's kind of a cache of the uh, page table to get to perform the translation from the virtual address to the physical address. Once you have the physical address, then you can access to the memory, the physical memory. So it may be a cache, maybe a main memory. And here in this example, so this picture shows this is a cache. This is a cache. You can see that you have two options. Sometimes it's an address represent a cache. And then it is, you can, we then go back to what the extra three describes. So we have to, like in this, in this case, we have the direct mapping cache and then fetch data. Or it directly access to a main memory and then you can get that as well. Okay. So this is when we consider the TLB also included in the big picture. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So then another diagram shows the, the overall picture. So you can see that again, typically we will first when we have when once we have the virtual address, we will first access the TLB to see whether we can get our desired content, the physical address in the TLB or not. So if the TLB, if it's hit, and then we can get the physical address, right? And then we determine that, so for this one, this is a bit right or read. If it's a read, and then we will read the data from the cache. And then determine whether it's a cache hit or the cache miss. If it's a write operation to this data, and then we will determine right why whether you have a the cache hit or, or miss. Okay. So you can see that the different different options the choice depends on what the what is the CPU request. Request the write write data or the 
read data. And it depends on whether in the cache we have the cache hit or the cache miss. So, any questions? No questions? Notice that this is not the entire big picture. So for example, when your TLB, so this TLB cache is kind of the, it is miss. And then we have some other option or the actions need to do. Which we need to, first we need to update your TLB. Right, and then we will use the because TLB is the cache of the, the lookup uh, the page table. So then we will directly go to the page table to get the physical address and do the following determination of the cache right or the read and the blah blah those stuffs. And also we need to update your TLB. So this is just the part of the big picture, not the entire one. Move to the lecture six. Can you, can you see my screen? The lecture six. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. So I already, for the lecture six, I already posted the slides on the Sakai. So you can take a look at that. So, lecture six uh, is kind of the, the Introduce some of the basic knowledge and the kind of the review of the some some knowledge already covered in the undergrad level computer architecture. The considering uh, part of the class uh, did not to take the undergrad level computer architecture before, so I think it's very necessary to review them and then also to refresh your memory about that. Okay. And uh, till now, what we have learned is about the all about is about memory, right? Uh, yes, yeah, for the lecture two, we discussed briefly about the performance evaluation for the metrics. But the majority of knowledge we have learned is about the memory system, the theoretical memory system. And that is focus of the, the part one of this course. So we learned that the cache based optimization, the cache organizations, the in lecture three, advanced optimizations for the cache and virtual memory. We, what do we just finish in lecture five? So this is what we have learned till now about the memory. And uh, starting from the lecture six, we'll go to a new phase about the execution, more about the execution. That is covered in the lecture six to the lecture 11. So how can we efficiently execute? So the memory already provides those data to us. So in the process, in the data pass, how should we efficiently execute? So that is part two. And after finish the part two, starting from the lecture, 12, so we will then go to the part three, that is the domain specific computer architecture, which is we will mainly focus on the AI hardware architecture as a case study. So that is, that is what the part three will mainly cover.
And uh, so, more specifically, what we will discuss in the part two. So, this lecture, lecture six, so we will discuss the, the basic of the pipeline. And then, because pipeline is so fundamental and so general, so it provides a lot of the opportunities and improvement. But again, so notice that there's no free lunch. When we use the pipeline, actually, it also, as compared to without using pipeline, actually, it brings some new issues. And we need to solve those issues because pipeline, the benefit is so significant. We still want to use that. But we need to find some mitigation plan, the mitigation solution for that. Like for some of the data hazard and uh, control hazard, we need to find some approaches to solve them. That is in the lecture seven, lecture nine will be covered. And also very important, that is how to perform the out of order execution to improve the ex to improve the execution efficiency of the, the processor. That is the lecture eight we are covered. And also we will go through some of the other execution paradigms at VIW, Superscalar, SIMD, and so on. And actually SIMD will be connected to the domain specific computer architecture switched for the AI architecture. And so you will see that so in the current state of art, wafer scale techniques, so it uh, the AI chips, a very large chip from the Cerebus company. So actually they're using kind of the, the not SIMD, but the MIMD, the strategy. And uh, for the AI workload, like for the lost neural work, so it is it naturally the kind of the very suitable for the SIMD or the MIM. Any questions? For the plan of the, the part two. Okay, let's begin our journey in the part two. So first let's have a brief review of the, the ISA instruction set architecture. So actually for, I say you can view this, as we have learned in the undergrad level computer. So actually this is exactly the interface between the Software part, compiler, and the hardware part. And uh, traditionally, ISA is a kind of the central topic in computer. And in the old days, the computer that is can be you can study. Most of the computer design, the research efforts is to design, develop the, the efficient ISA. So why it is so important? Because you can view this kind of vocabulary of the, the instruction and to command a computer. But when we design, especially when we design general purpose computer architecture, we always need to have this ISA. That is extremely very important. If you want to do something very, very specific hardware accelerator, for example, if you want to just use an FPGA to implement like a FFT or some function, so then in that case, you don't need the ISA. Because it's, it's just, a, you can view that's just a one instruction just to execute. But if you want your design become more reconfigurable or more general purpose, so, so you will must have some of the ISA design. No matter it's kind of a very simplified design or kind of more comprehensive design, you will need that. 
Any questions? And for example, even for like for Google's TPU, we will discuss that in detail in the part three. But that is kind of very simple. From the perspective of hardware, then this the TPU is kind of very simple design. It's just using the systolic array. So the more details about systolic array we will cover in the in the part three, starting from the lecture twelve. But even for that, Google still designed extend some of the instruction instruction set to load and store those the stuffs modified ISA. And uh, so, as I mentioned before, I say it's a kind of interface between the hardware and the software. Actually, this is also provide a type of the abstraction and hide the hardware complexity from the software. And uh, I say it provides some of the set of the simple operations, the addition, multiplication, and so on. So as the software programmer, you don't need to care about so which part of the adder and the multiplier in your microarchitecture need to do the operations. You just need to use such operations provided by the ISA and hide the hardware complexity. And uh, it provides a mechanism that the software tells the what should be done. So the goal of the ISA, so in a big picture is actually, so we want to have to do from the very expressive high level language to the very low level machine language, the, the binary codes. And uh, in this case, it contains the compiler and the assembler your undergraduate level computer architecture. And uh, so for the machine languages, we know that it's a binary representation of the instruction. Just contains the zero and the one, and uh, those the machine code. So your instruction you in the machine language format actually can be directly executed by the processor. Since it's just a zero and a one. That is not expressive. It's very efficient for the perspective of the software programmer. And that's the reason we need the assembly language. And uh, you can view assembly language provide a trade off between the readability and the friendliness. So, in many embedded system development, in many cases, we still need to directly use the assembly language. By the way, so how many uh, how many of you uh, learned assembly language before? You undergrad level computer architecture course. So, any of you? Didn't learn or didn't use that before. Any of you? Okay, some student didn't uh, uh, learn the no, the, the little never used. So that's fine. So in this course, I will not ask you to do the programming um, using like the assembly language. So that is typically what I ask students to do in the undergrad level computer architecture course. Because I will use the one, one third of the course to 
teach the assembly language and then do some of the programming in the sim assembly language simulator and, uh, and so on. And I even ask a student to translate assembly language to the machine codes and to translate machine codes back to the assembly language. And so on. But for that is for the machine, that is for the undergrad level course. But for this course, graduate level course, as I mentioned, this is we need a lot of the materials to cover, and uh, this is more system level course. So I will not ask you to do the programming in that course. And uh, even you don't, you you never see the assembly code before. It is kind of expressive. So for example, it's kind of very exp expressive. Like here, you perform the modification. Of the F0, F2, and results go to the F4. So that is very expressive. So it should not quite have very difficult for you to know what this instruction is, what is the meaning of this instruction. So if you have any questions, don't know what this, this instruction is doing, so you can just unmute yourself and let me know. Okay, one student ask, is this similar to the hardware design language? That's a good question. So assembly language, it is still kind of the software programming. So here, when I talk about the hardware design language, that means that the hardware description language, the HDL, and like the VHDL, the very long. So that is totally different. So actually, that is also what I emphasize again and again in my VSI design course. So for those, the no matter it's uh, you use the, the like C codes, Python, assembly language. So actually, here what we are doing is the programming. You have a CPU, you have a hardware. You want to program, you want to do something on that existing hardware. But for the hardware description language, like the very very log of the VHDL. Actually, you want to use that language to describe the function of the hardware. Your final goal is to actually to design a new hardware. That is very, very different. Like you can use, maybe some of you use the FPGA, right? You use the, you can program, you can do, Write a very low code to the FPGA. And actually, because FPGA you can view is kind of the reconfigurable chip. So in principle, we can you can view that actually you are building a new hardware using the very log to let the FPGA become be, become a type of the new function of the hardware. So that is very different from those that exist the software language, programming language, and the hardware description language. Is that clear right now? Okay. So <laughs> as I mentioned in the beginning of this class, so who are not touch, touched the very log in this course, because this is a system course. So if you want to have that kind of the knowledge, so you can take my VSI design course. So some the like some example of the, the assembly language. So notice that for the assembly language, depends on the, your different ISA, like for the MIPS, or the ARM or the Intel x86. So the, the appearance of the, the assembly codes may be different. Okay. And but so always have the very similar format. So for example, here, like for this instruction, actually we want to perform the multiplication of the 
F0 and F2, the values stored in the F0 and F2. F0 and F2 let me two registers. And then the results we are stored to the register F4. We are the floating point register. F means floating point. But when, when you have the, the LD, that means the load. That means the load something from the memory to the register. And here the XY, it is the means that the base address stored in the X1 register, right? X1 is a register stored at some address. And the zero, that is the offset. You have the base address, you have the offset, you can get the address, your target address in your memory, and then load, using that address, load the value of that address to the register F0, right? Any questions? So, so I think most of you already knew the assembly code before. So I don't I don't go to the too many details, just to help you to refresh your memory. And also like for the BNE, this is a branch. BNE means the branch if not equal, that means that when the X1 and the X2, they are, these two registers, their values are not the same, and then we will go back to the loop, this instruction. We labeled this instruction as the loop. We'll go back to this. You can see that typically, that is what we typically use for like, a, when we want to implement a for loop, how do you implement, translate a for loop from the high level languages, the C or Python to the low level assembly languages. That is what we do. Any questions? Okay, so I ran out of time. So this is the, the this end of our today's class. And, uh, this Friday we'll continue to go through the the ISA. So from the basic uh, operation type of the, the ISA, and uh, then we will review the pipeline. The, We'll not go to the details of that, but just to help you to again re refresh your mind and uh, to know the five general stage of pipeline and the uh, pipeline registers, pipeline diagram, and so on. And after that, so we'll begin next week. We'll begin the lecture seven, so the dependency issue when we use the pipeline. Okay, so that's end of that our today's class. So if you have any questions, you can enter my uh, WebEx room uh, in the 10.30, that's my office hour. Okay, also, if you have any questions for the quiz, you can ask me. So also, uh, please do you uh, have some available time to take participate in our survey, midterm survey, and give me your thoughts and uh, suggestions and comments to this course. I'd be very, very appreciative for that. Let's end, let's end off our today's class. See you this Friday.